It's 1933. A little-known aircraft designer lies dead on an operating table after a botched colostomy operation. Weeks before, this racing plane designer had been given the go-ahead to work on a new design, designated Type 300. He had high hopes for the new aircraft and was building an expert team to help him carry the project to the finish line. With the threat of another war looming, it was vital that he work every hour to put the new fighter into production. He knew the Supermarine Shrew could be a war-winning aircraft. But alas, now the project was just as dead as its designer, Reginald J. Mitchell. Well, at least for today's debate. As historians, we have the opportunity to ask, what if things in the past had happened differently? So in this video, why don't we explore an alternative timeline where the Supermarine Shrew, or to give it its bloody silly name, the Spitfire, never made it off the drawing board. Now, you can probably tell from my voice that I'm a Londoner, and maybe because I'm a Londoner, I was brought up on the Spitfire myth. Now, not to take away from this significant fighter, which in our original timeline really did make a huge contribution to the British and Commonwealth war effort, but did it really make such an impact that had it not been invented, the Second World War would have altered its course significantly? So this brings us to one of the most celebrated periods of the Spitfire's legend, the Battle of Britain. In our original timeline, the Battle of Britain sees a near overwhelming force of German fighters and bombers targeting the British shores, fought off by fewer than 3,000 pilots in total. These Royal Air Force pilots and their allies fought predominantly in two aircraft, the Supermarine Spitfire and the Hawker Hurricane. While the Spitfire myth would proclaim its champion won the battle for the British, other students of the period would argue the Hurricane carried the win. It has been said by some that the Spitfire could have won the battle itself, but the Hurricane could never have won it alone. How true was that? Jump to our alternative timeline. Britain is facing invasion. With France now overrun by the Wehrmacht, the Luftwaffe has acquired bases on the French coast, which puts its bomber force in range of London. RAF squadrons flying in support of the BEF in France were no match for the Luftwaffe's onslaught, often being caught on the ground or outnumbered in the air. However, during the debacle of Dunkirk, the Hurricanes had seen some success attacking unescorted light bombers and Stukas before they reached the swarming beaches. It also showed that it could hold its own with a comparatively fast but less manoeuvrable BF-110. The rugged Hurricane seems like a good gun platform and certainly takes some punishment. As summer approaches, now waiting to defend British shores, the RAF is in a slightly more advantageous position than it was in France. Though still outnumbered, they have a force multiplier in the form of home chain, an early warning radar or RDF system, and the fact they will be fighting over their own territory. As the Luftwaffe switches their attacks from shipping to RAF airfields, it's clear that the Hurricane is outclassed by the faster and normally higher Messerschmitt 109s. Yet the British fighters continue to harrow the German formations. Even when the airfields are put out of action, the rugged fighter can be operated from fairly rough grass strips due to its wide-spaced undercarriage. Continually caught below the incoming Germans, the squadron commanders of 11 Group share the concerns with their leader, Air Vice Marshal Keith Park. He petitions fighter command to allow him to order his squadrons into the air sooner, as a build-up is spotted over the French coast. This has limited effect on the battle, although the Hurricanes can climb higher before the engagement, the 109s are invariably above them. Yet, if they want to defend their bombers, which also fly at a lower altitude, they have to combat the Hurricanes below them. Near collapse due to the attacks on the airfields, 11 Group is barely holding on. Then suddenly, the enemy switches its focus to the capital. In a matter of days, 11 Group has repaired its airfields, re-equipped its squadrons, and is attacking the German formations on their long flights over southern England. They are now joined by 12 Group, covering London and the Midlands with their Hurricane squadrons. Faced with longer and longer escort missions, German 109 pilots, and to a lesser extent 110 crews, find that they have limited fuel to combat the slower Hurricanes and have to be wary of getting into an extended fight with the more manoeuvrable fighters. The RAF adopts a new policy, where they effectively move their defensive lines northward. While the 11 Group continues to attack the German formations piecemeal over the south of England, 12 Group 
begins to launch their squadrons en masse. With the trial and error, 12 Group Commander Air Vice Marshal Lee Mallory manages to amass enough hurricanes to put up an impressive spectacle, if somewhat with limited tactical results. The RAF pilots now find that the bomber formations are reaching their targets with fewer and fewer escorting fighters, making them vulnerable to the larger groups of hurricanes. The psychological effect on the German air crews is dramatic. What's more, the 109s are easier to pick off in their return flight by 11 group hurricanes, which have landed, refueled, and returned to the fight. Often these tired German pilots opt to employ the 109's superior dive characteristics to disengage and crawl across the channel to their French bases. The German bombers have to face the gauntlet without this ability to quickly bug out of the fight. Initially, when the Luftwaffe commanders realise what the British are doing, they send over preemptive fighter sweeps of 109's to clear the hurricanes from the sky. 11 groups suffer some of the worst losses over the coming days, but quickly learn to disengage when encountering these flights. The observer corps is more often than not able to telephone to warn about these fighter sweeps, and fighter command simply keeps their hurricanes on the ground. Meanwhile, 12 group is still engaging any bombers that make it far enough north if somewhat inefficiently. With so many bombers being lost over the south coast, Hermann Göring, head of the Luftwaffe, berates his fighter leaders as cowards. He orders them to fly close escort to the bombers from now on. Suddenly, the RAF Hurricanes are no longer vulnerable to 109s dropping on them from the sun. When surprised, they can more easily pick off the bombers and fighters sent over from France. By October, the struggle for air supremacy over England is all but over. The Luftwaffe is now launching larger and larger night attacks which are almost impossible to counter by the hurricane squadrons. The day attacks seem to be over. Operation Sea Lion, the invasion of southern England, is shelved and, though never cancelled, is not dusted off again for the entirety of the war. Just over 1,200 hurricanes have been lost during the summer months and nearly 700 pilots of fighter command are dead. Many more pilots have been left with disfigured bodies or are at the very end of the endurance. So could the Hurricane have won the Battle of Britain on its own? Well, we could argue that it could have been done, but at a much higher cost to the RAF. If we assume that the absence of the Spitfire in the RAF arsenal wouldn't have changed German tactics, the job might have been done with the Hurricane. In our original timeline, Hurricanes were responsible for many more aircraft destroyed during the Battle of Britain, both fighters and bombers, of course, that was because they were more numerous, accounting for 54% or so of the total fighter command strength. That being said, the Spitfire did in reality have a much higher kill to loss ratio. Hurricanes had an approximate kill to loss ratio of about 1.62 to 1, while Spitfires had a kill to loss ratio of about 2.3 to 1. Of course, these numbers are open to debate and depend on the accuracy of the data. What is important to remember is that not every aircraft loss meant a pilot was killed. Many could survive even when the aircraft could not. As the RAF was fighting over home territory, these pilots could be recovered and put back into new aircraft, while all aircrew shot down over Britain were effectively lost to the Luftwaffe. When you crunch the numbers, you find the survivability of pilots flying either the Hurricane or Spitfire reported destroyed was about 54% on average across the battle. This figure was actually significantly higher during July and dropped in August. What I mean by this is, if your aircraft was shot down and crashed or was beyond repair, you had a less than 50-50 chance of getting out on average over the course of the battle. What's more, Blenheim and Defiant aircrew had an even slimmer chance of surviving if successfully shot down by the enemy. The key factor in winning the Battle of Britain, in reality, and in our alternative history, would have been training enough pilots to fight. If the British had only focused on producing one fighter during the run-up to the Battle of Britain, they could have conservatively built at least one and a half Hurricanes for every Spitfire produced. We could also safely assume that at least a similar figure for other fighters being manufactured, such as Blenheims and Defiance. For example, roughly 1,500 Mark I Spitfires were built, so on those figures alone you might have expected at least 2,250 Hurricanes to have been built in their place. In addition to the approximate 1,715 Hurricanes built in our original timeline. So while the British would certainly have had enough fighters, they may have started to run out of trained pilots much sooner than they did in reality. On average in August 1940, the RAF was losing about 25% of its monthly hurricane strength 
and slightly less of their Spitfires. About 40% of those Hurricane pilots who were shot down perished, and a few percent fewer Spitfire pilots also died. This is of course lower than the survivability rate I quoted earlier. So this might mean at least a thousand Hurricanes would have been shot down in our alternative timeline, and perhaps 400 pilots killed in action. But that is a very conservative estimate. I would also suspect that had the Luftwaffe and their later allies been met by an all hurricane force, the RAF would have lost far more aircraft than it did in real life. Basically, it wouldn't be unreasonable to expect a higher attrition rate and death toll in an all hurricane Battle of Britain scenario. Although the hurricane was certainly inferior to the Messerschmitt 109 in several aspects, it wasn't a complete sitting duck. We're normally told that the job of the Spitfire was to engage the 109s, while the Hurricanes took on the bombers. However, there really wasn't that much coordination between RAF squadrons which were equipped with either a Hurricane or a Spitfire. What might have been true was that, as a Spitfire could climb faster than a Hurricane, they were invariably higher than the slower British fighter. This meant that it was logical they go after the usually higher German fighters. Perhaps each operation room did have a genius who orchestrated scrambles so that Spitfires and Hurricanes could coordinate attacks without realising they were doing so, but I don't think that was the case. This being said, when each squadron met the enemy, especially for those of 11 Group, their main target was never the fighters and always the bombers, regardless of what aircraft they flew. Ultimately, shooting down a fighter didn't stop bombs dropping on Blighty. This often left RAF pilots taking on a bomber formation with one eye on the scavenged rear view mirrors looking out for snappers. So had there been no Spitfire, Hurricanes would have taken on the bombers, 109s and 110s, as well as the occasional force from the Regia Aeronautica, equally with stoic determination to defend Britain. At the end of the day, I would argue that what really concluded the Battle of Britain was not the type of aircraft flown by the British pilots, but rather British production, home chain and its observer course support network, German shifting tactics, and the English Channel. So what do you think? Am I completely wrong in my estimation of the Hurricane's capabilities? Would the British simply have operated other foreign-made aircraft already in production? Would we have seen the Germans goose-stepping down Whitehall? Leave your comments below and join the debate. What would have happened in a world with no Supermarine Spitfire? And if you made it this far, then please give the video a like to help it spread to others. And why not watch the other video I made for you on screen now?